Okay, so today's the 8th of February 2015, and this is a follow-up to last week's court card video. And I'd like to make two points that I think are going to lead to better readings. And one one point is about the reader and how um, the reader ought to, or if the reader sticks to what they know, then they don't have to bluff. And the second is about people and why they're in our life and what they're for and why we need them. And it's going to be helpful if the questioner goes off understanding this particular point and then they're going to have a better chance of good relationships. So point number one is for the reader. And it's basically forget about relating court cards to the signs of the zodiac. Because um, if you do, it's asking for trouble. And I think one obvious point is that there are 16 court cards, king, queen, knight, and page of the four suits, but there are only 12 signs of the zodiac. So there isn't a direct correlation, so what are you going to do? You have to leave out, okay, we've got the king and the queen, they would seem to be part of it, but what do you do with the page? Because the page isn't a member of the royal family, and the knight isn't a member of the royal family either, so you're going to have to leave, leave out one of them, and you can argue leave out the page or leave out the night and you can make good arguments for both situations but um, when you have to make something fit in this case by leaving out a night or a page somehow it doesn't work I don't think that's the way it's supposed to be because um, when you have to twist something to make it fit somehow it's always twisted and it's not quite I don't want to say natural but it's not quite correct um, the other thing is it's important to realise that readers, most people, don't know much about the nature of the signs of the zodiac anyway. So um, at the same time, we do know certain things that are not astrological that we can use, but I'll get to them in a minute. So when it comes to the zodiac, um, um, readers may know a few key words about the different signs, or they can give a general description. But astrology is very specific. Right, so blanket statements and general st general observations are sometimes confusing, but they're often wrong. So, at the same time, if you're if you're doing a reading for somebody and you choose you've you've got a card and you say this card relates to this particular sign, and if you start describing the sign in one way, the person might disagree with the description. Right, so you can have an argument on your hands because you say. Leo's like this, and they say, I'm a Leo, and I'm not at all like that. So what do you do? You have to backtrack or change your situation. And this can, maybe you need to back down from what you're saying. And this can mean that you lose credibility as a reader. So let's say you, you talk about Aries, right? And you say, Aries is like this and this. And the person says, well, I'm an Aries, and I'm not like that. Right? So you might say, okay, well, um, the thing is, you've got the moon in Scorpio. And that's why you behave in this particular way. But then they, they may say, well, my cousin's an Aries with the moon in Scorpio, and we're not alike in that way. So you then have to say, well, okay, Aries and Scorpio ruled by Mars, and you've got Mars in, Le in Virgo, whereas your cousin has Mars in Leo. But at that point, it looks like you're bending the rules or changing the rules or changing the statement to make yourself, to, to make what you say fit or to make yourself right. Um and this is not a good direction to go in. So I'm saying that the astrological take isn't right, really, during a tarot reading. On the other hand, let's say you're reading a book, a storybook to a two-year-old. And in the book you read, the king ordered everybody in the land to look for the princess. And the child says, what's a king? Right? You already know what to say. Or you can think of various ways um, or examples that you could give to describe a king that's going to make sense to the child, as well as being correct about what a king is like. So when a king turns up in a reading, right, um, why, why start talking about something you don't really know that much about? This king is relates to Aries. Right, so the King of Cups is a Cancerian, let's say, and the question says, "What's a Cancerian like?" And you realise that you don't really, you have to admit, you don't really know for sure, but you know what a king is, 
in a fairy story, let's say, or in a child storybook, or you can say something sensible about what a king is like or what he does or how he behaves when he's in good form and when he's in bad form. So let's say when he's a bad king, that can represent a reversed king, assuming that you use reverse cards. And in the same way, you can make useful points about a queen, right? Again, think about the fairy story or the, the, the children's story. So the queen is important because she produces the heirs to the throne, right? She's valuable and important. And so that idea about producing offspring might be important in a reading, right? So the queen, the queen reverse comes up, or the queen comes up reverse, so that uh, the situation isn't going to be able to develop the way it should, because somebody isn't producing children, or maybe the person is taking the situation and just going and and just uh, working with it and not really adding anything to it added value, added benefits, or whatever. And in, in this way, the, ch the queen is not producing children. And then if you think of chess, there's a king in the chess, in a, when you play chess, there's a queen as well. And the queen has power, and she can move quickly. And she can cover a lot of squares at once. So she has to be able to move quickly and grab the children and get out of there if she's in danger. This is unlike the knight. Because right, we've got kings, queen, knights, and pages in the tarot, and we've got kings, queens, and knights in chess piece in in a chess game. So the the knight can move three squares, two, one and two, or two and one, in an angle. But so he's kind of limited in what he can do. But he can jump over other pieces, and that's an advantage. So in what way does the knight of cups? In what way is he able to jump over a difficulty? Or how, so what, what would be an obstacle right in front of the questioner if they're represented by a knight? You, you can jump over that obstacle. So it needn't really get in the way. And we've probably all heard of the Knights of the Round Table, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. So they've got knights, that kind of knight is a code of chivalry. right? So with a knight, and I'm thinking about the Knights of the Round Table, the value sense of the person is important. And they're supposed to do what's right and what's correct. And they're supposed to do the honourable thing if you're a knight upright. So a reverse knight can be somebody who's tempted or it's an indication that the question is going to be tempted to take shortcuts, right? Or to cut corners or do something or take some kind of course of action that is a little bit questionable or not quite right. And then a page. A page is a young person. And is like a kind of a servant or somebody in a subordinate or lower position. So when you're a page, you can't really expect to be giving orders or controlling the situation because you're in an in a subordinate position. But if you're a knight, a page rather, and you do your job and you learn, then maybe later you're going to be able to rise up into a position of power. And if you remember the lessons you learned on your way up, you're going to be a good ruler. And a useful ruler. But you're not there yet. So, kings, queen, knights and pages. You can do something with those cards. even and, and you don't need to know about the signs of the zodiac. And at the same time, if you describe kings, queen, knights and pages in this way, the questioner isn't going to be confused or worried or miss the point if you talk about kings and what they do and what they can't do in ways that we all understand. You know, you're not using specialised knowledge and like um, Aries and Gemini and Cardinal and Fixed and Mutable and Fire and Air and Earth and Water. And you're not using any kind of jargon. You're talking about people. And it works. So trust the card that comes up and talk about it in a way that the questioner can understand and they'll go off with a better understanding of what to do or how to deal with a certain situation their own strengths and weaknesses, or the strengths and weaknesses of the person that they're dealing with. So point number two is about people. And I talked about this in a recent video, although not um, in, uh, it wasn't in connection with court cards. But we've got other people in our lives. Um, and the question is, why are they there, or what are they for? So I'd like to present a point of understanding that the reader can pass on to the questioner. So that 
Later, the question can deal more wisely with themselves and with other people, especially when there seems to be um, a problem with another person, which happens all the time. So what are other people for? Sometimes they're just good company. You know, you can share an experience with other people and enjoy life better because you can share the moment with somebody important to you. And that's very, very enjoyable. But they, they can also help us pay off karma if you take this point of view that, or take that position that we're in life and we owe certain stuff. And so if we can, having other people there gives us a chance to repay debts or to, to be helpful. We give our time and energy to help other people. And that's satisfying, but also means that um, we're paying off karma. Um, but the, point, the, the main point I want to make here is that other people teach us about us. And that's the point. And it's particularly true when we get overly upset with them. Um, and when, when we get overly upset, this is when we should turn the spotlight on ourselves and turn it off the other person who seems to be the problem or the cause of the problem. Because you can shine the light on them, but you can't change people to suit yourself. But if you turn the light on you and examine your own self, then you're going to discover what's wrong or what needs to be changed or fixed. Then you fix it and then the problem goes away and you live more in harmony with yourself. So let, let's say you're driving and you see somebody changing lanes without signalling. And th this happens all the time, you know, because people drive badly at different times. And usually you ignore it and you accept it as part of the daily drive or a typical day on the road. So you, you might think, what an idiot, but, you know, you forget about it. On the other hand, let's say somebody changes lanes and you get really, really annoyed right you curse them and you swear and you know they didn't signal and what an idiot and you get all worked up about it and maybe you lose your temper right so this is when when you have that, that kind of emotional overreaction that's when it's time to look at your own driving habits or whatever the situation is that's when you turn the spotlight on yourself because your overreaction with driving is the key that you're not as good a driver as you think you are um, or you've been developing bad driving habits, but you didn't realize it. And your annoyance with somebody else is a kind of wake-up call. So you can get back to the good habits that you have and be a better driver because the overreaction means that your image of yourself is inaccurate and needs to be fixed. So other people teach us about us. So you can curse the other driver as much as you want, but it doesn't do any good. You know, you can't change other people to suit yourself. And there have been, you, you know there have been times when you didn't erupt and you just let it go. So when somebody did something stupid in traffic, but you didn't mind or you didn't care that much. So what's changed is you and it's sort of time to change back. So in a reading, when a questioner has an overreaction about somebody else or gets worked up about what somebody else says or does or somebody else is doing. You know, they, they, they explain how they can't stand this person. And with a situation like that, they really can do good work by getting, if possible, by getting the question to see how to recognise themselves in the situation that is giving them the problem. And if they can do that, then the problem dissolves, right? And you've got peacefulness and tranquility on the part of the questioner. Sometimes you can't get the question to make the connection. They just don't want to know it, right? Or they don't want to see it, even though you point out that, the, and, and they also understand that if they were to turn the spotlight on themselves, there would be relief and they would get control of the situation if they take that route. But if the person isn't responsive, you, you just have to let it go. But... Um, it can be useful to put the idea in the person's mind so that later um, it's going to click, right? So it's going to make sense to them so that maybe at the moment of the reading they're not responsive, but later they're going to see the value and, and they're going to be able to solve the problem. So um, with a court card then, you can't cover every possibility um, every time in every situation but 
you can use what you and the questioner both know about kings, queens, knights and pages. And you're able to give them an idea of the strengths and weaknesses of the person or the, the different types of people that these court cards represent so they deal better with the situation. That's with the court card. Um, but also talking about other people teach us about us means that you can give them a bit of insight into what to do to deal better and more creatively with other people who are in their lives for good or bad. You know, and when other people get us really annoyed, you don't have to uh, be thrown by it or be um, sort of thrust back into the past. You can actually um, deal creatively with the situation. Partly because you know that, if I say it again, that other people teach us about us. Uh, so that was it for the... the um, two follow-up points about the Celtic Cross. The next is going to be at the Celtic, about the Celtic Cross, the introductory stuff. Um, but I'd like to mention before I go that I'm setting up a new site where um, there's lots of content, but there's also, um, if you want, you can join the site. There's a membership. You give an email address and then you get access to um, more detailed, more complete information, audio, video, text, and you can download stuff as well. So I'll let you know about that later. Um, I'm hoping to have it up and running by the end of February. Um, but um, uh, I'll if you if you go to the taroblog.com, um, you'll see. I'll, I'll make an announcement there, but I'll also mention it in future YouTube videos. So that's it for the moment. Um, next week, next Sunday. Ideally, we'll get the beginning of the Celtic Cross. So have a good week. And um, that's it for the moment. Bye-bye. Uh,